In the mid-1800s, in a small town outside of Boston, a young artist was just beginning his career. In a short time, his illustrations would grace the pages of magazines across America. By the end of his life, he would be known throughout the world as a master of American painting. His name was Winslow Homer. Homer is perhaps one of the most beloved of American artists. He was fortunate, he lived a very long time. He matured throughout his career. He was experimental. He worked with watercolor. He was a superb draftsman. He was a consummate oil painter. There's nothing that he didn't try. But he's just a darn good painter. And he says a lot. He isn't just fooling around with paint or watercolor. He says something. Through his art, Winslow Homer says something about America, about war, about humankind, and always about nature. But before he was famous, at the beginning of his story, there was Winslow Homer's Belmont. Belmont was an idyllic farming community when Homer's family arrived in the late 1850s. Winslow and his two brothers knew the area well because their uncles had settled in town decades earlier. Merchant William Flagg Homer, his wealthiest uncle, built this elegant villa in 1853 as a summer residence. The Homer house was an architectural showcase, a combination bracketed Italianate and French mansard design. Inside, the 15-room home was adorned with elaborate detail. A suspended staircase curves to the height of the 12-foot ceiling. A rounded marble fireplace adds warmth and beauty to the parlor. The oval dining room was designed with hand-carved concave doors that melt into curved walls. The expansive library features a grand oak-paneled fireplace. And outside is the crowning glory of the home, an octagonal cupola with sweeping views for miles around. The house was a symbol of the family's success a place for the large Homer clan to gather. A few streets away, Winslow's family home was modest in comparison, but his father had dreams of more. He left the family when Winslow was just 13 years old and headed to California in the hope of making a killing in the gold rush. He returned two years later bankrupt. By then, young Winslow was a budding artist and soon became a freelance illustrator. He drew what he knew. Boston's lively street scenes and Belmont's country pastimes set in the hills, woods, and ponds he had loved since childhood. Before long, his career pulled him away from Belmont and into New York City where the popular new magazine Harper's Weekly gave young Homer an impressive assignment, the November 1860 cover illustration of the new president-elect. Winslow Homer's star was rising in the New York art world, but love of family and nature called him home to rural Belmont on holidays and every summer where he was rarely seen without paper and charcoal in his hands. In 1859, when Belmont was incorporated as a town, Homer chronicled the historic moment in a sketch called The New Town of Belmont. In the corner, 
Homer inserted himself and a young companion watching the train on its way to Boston. Belmont is important in Homer's career. It fostered a place to be with his family. It fostered a landscape of inspiration to him. It gave him nourishment for the rest of his life. April, 1861. Suddenly, everything changed. The Civil War had begun, and the Homer House became active in the war effort. One of Winslow's most famous Civil War sketches depicted a group of women in the front parlor sewing uniforms for the Union soldiers. With the war on, Winslow had a tough decision to make. The Civil War undoubtedly created a problem for a lot of artists. You could carry on your career as you wished, or you could go to the front, which is what Homer decided to do. And he was given a pass in 1861 to travel behind the lines as an artist correspondent. I think he perhaps felt a responsibility to use his talent as a responsible citizen. His brother Arthur enlisted. Homer did not. He served in a different way. What he saw and sketched over the next year would take a heavy toll on the 25-year-old Homer. When the war ended, Homer rested for a while in Belmont and returned to his first love, painting. But the impact of the war was now visible in his work. There are two paintings that come to mind that perhaps show Belmont in a way that is recognizable even today. And they're both of 1865, which I think is interesting because they do speak about the land and the return to the land of the population that was engaged in war just a short time ago. Veteran in a New Field shows a veteran. He's discarded his jacket and a canteen in the foreground of the field. So you're told by that that this is a veteran who is returning to harvest what he can left of his field. The Brush Hour is another painting that is redolent of Belmont. It shows two young boys who are perhaps forced to take the place of their dead uncles or their departed father and play the men's role after the war. So it's a very haunting painting. In 1866, Homer, on the left, traveled with his Belmont friend, Albert Kelsey, to Paris, where his new Civil War painting, Prisoners from the Front, was on exhibit at the prestigious Exposition Universelle. It shows the gathering of prisoners from the Confederate side be brought before a Union general. The Union general is almost welcoming them back into nationhood, I like to think. Throughout the 1860s and 70s, Homer's work was filled with scenes of Belmont people and society modern women seeking greater independence, affluent young women playing the daring new game of croquet on the Homer House lawn, women employed in mills and factories after the war, homemakers and immigrants in domestic service, children at play idealized by Homer, children at work harvesting the town's strawberry crop, and hard-working Belmont farmers, the men Homer admired most. One of his best-known paintings, Boys in a Pasture, depicts two young Belmont boys, Patrick Keenan and John Kearney. They posed for Homer for 75 cents a day and became not only a part of Belmont history, but art history as well. In 2010, Boys in a Pasture was selected by the U.S. Postal Service to be a commemorative stamp. 
Patrick Keenan appeared in several other Homer paintings, including The Blue Boy. By the mid-1870s, Winslow Homer's time in Belmont came to an end. He moved to the coast of Maine, where the pastoral nature of his work took a forceful new direction. His stylish Belmont bells were now strong female figures. His steadfast Belmont farmers remade as heroic North Atlantic fishermen. His gentle Belmont meadows exchanged for a mighty ocean. Homer's earlier pastoral work was transformed into a great theme in his career the fragility of human life against the awesome power of nature. Winslow Homer died in 1910 at age 74. The grand house of his youth had been sold outside of the Homer family more than two decades earlier, and by the 1920s, a crisis threatened. A real estate developer was eyeing the land on which the Homer house sat. He planned to buy it, tear the house down, and split the property into seven lots. Luckily, there was a savior in Belmont, a whole group of them. The Belmont Woman's Club put historic preservation over profit and mobilized to save the Homer house. At a time when it was rare for a woman to own property in the United States, the Belmont Woman's Club purchased the Homer House for $25,000. Then they got to work. They updated the gas lighting to electricity and began to hold meetings in their new home. In the years that followed, the women hosted cultural and educational events. And during wartime, like the women in Homer's early sketches, they came together to support America's soldiers. Today, the Homer House is a special place, bustling with educational and civic events, Once upon a time, where visitors can imagine a time when young Winslow Homer created art before the world took notice and where guests of the future can step into the past and experience the heritage, culture, and community of Winslow Homer's Belmont. <laughs> <laughs>